So, in case you didn't know, last week I was gone. I was gone all week. I went to Barcelona for the Flesh and Blood uh, World Championship. I said Pro Tour in the title, but it's World Championship. Um, I was really excited about this. Uh, if you guys don't know, Flesh and Blood is another card game that I play. I play it a lot. I really like it. It's only an in-person card game, though. And uh, I haven't been able to practice a ton of Flesh and Blood lately because uh, because of Runeterra stuff, right? Like, we had the Worlds Qualifier for Runeterra, which I needed to do well in in order to qualify for that. Luckily, I did. So that's good. That paid off. Um, but the World Championships was coming up for Flesh and Blood, and I wasn't super prepared. Now, I had a pretty good idea of what hero I was going to play. A new set came out, and it was all Mechanologist, which is like one region or hero, right? One region. Um, and I don't play a lot of mech. I play wizard usually. And there's a wizard right now that's quite good. Her name is Icelander. She's an ice wizard. If you've ever seen my story times, I've probably talked about her because uh, I play her a lot. I really, really like her. And so the plan was to play Icelander. But the buzz leading up to the world championship was this new card that Dromai got. Dromai is a draconic illusionist that basically plays out dragons. Now, normally in Flesh and Blood, there isn't any permanence. Uh, for the most part, things are just actions. You cast a card, and the card is head jab. And what it is is you're punching your opponent for three damage, right? But then your opponent can block. And then once you do that, they go away. It's not like you play a unit with three power. You play an attack that has three damage. That's how. That's kind of how flesh and blood works, right? Now, Dromai is different. Illusionist in particular is different because Illusionist plays out permanence. Permanence that you could do what's called, like, we call popping. It has phantasm. If you block with a unit with six or more power then the dragon just kind of poofs into nothingness because it's an illusion right um now drum i got this card called tome of something 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 i don't i don't even know tome of the imperial flame i think it's called and everybody was raging about it now what tome allowed drum to do was really skimp out on resources it allowed them to play a very 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 light resource curve but still have all of their power cards. They're not, they're not missing any of their power cards, right? Um, now, beforehand, before this happened, the Icelander Dromai matchup, in my opinion, was probably pretty close to 75-25 for Icelander. Now, the majority of people would tell you differently. They would say, no, 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 it's super Dromai flavored, blah, 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 blah. But like, I was just crushing Dromai's left and right. Through all these kind of tournaments, I was always like beating Dromai's with Icelander even though a lot of people thought that it was it was flipped. So I wasn't super worried about it. Now, because Icelander does split damage, she does physical and arcane damage, uh, arcane, you, with, with physical damage, you can just block, right, normally. And Dromai's pretty good at blocking. However, arcane damage, you have to pitch resources to. And like I said, is already a pretty resource light deck. Now, when it adds Tome, it cuts even more resources. So in my head, I hadn't played the matchup, but in my head... I'm going, oh, wow, Icelander's already a really, really good deck. And now, because Dromai's are playing the Tome version with less high resource cards, or blues, as we call them, with less blues and almost all reds, low resource cards, um, I was like, wow, the matchup's probably even better than before. So that's just kind of like how I was thinking about it, right? And then it's like a day or two before I leave, and Prodigy, you guys may know Prodigy, used to play Runeterra, uh, hits me up and he's like, hey, dude, do you want to jam some games of like Dromai vs. Icelander? And I like finally had time. So I was like, yeah, okay, let's, let's jam a couple games. Let me make sure this Tome card isn't like completely insane, right? Um, and so we play and he kind of like blows me out and I die. And I'm like, ah, oh, whatever happens, you know, let's play another one. <laughs> so we play, we play another game and he casts Tome a couple times and I die. <laughs> and so I'm like, we have to play another game. And so what's happening with Tome is that the balancing in the Icelander versus Dromai matchup, the tempo balancing is incredibly important. Incredibly important. Because Icelander can slow things down with Frostbites. She forces your opponents to pay extra resources to do things, which Dromai doesn't really have in spades. And so you can, like, stuff her turns a couple times with a mix of popping her dragons, which can end her turn often, um, or frostbiting her out, right? So you send an attack, which forces resources out of her hands, and then you do something on her turn to freeze her up a bit, and then you send an attack, which freezes resources out of her hands, right? You, you get it? That's like kind of how it works. And you're always towing this very thin line, and whether or not you can tow the line, and whether or not you know how to is 
what made the matchup so interesting from both sides. It was a very, very, very skill-expressive matchup. The problem with Tome is that Tome let them draw two cards and then pitch two cards. So it's basically minus one card advantage. However, they pitch two cards and they're already up. They, that gives them two resources. And then they have an equipment that basically lets them get another resource for every red that's in their pitch zone, which is another resource, right? So like they basically get to cycle through their deck a bunch and then get a few resources. And so we kept getting these game states where I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning. Uh, and then they'd cast Tome and they draw into their cards that are very, very powerful cards, right? Things like Chromai and Miragai and Thamai. If you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. Just understand that they suck for me and I don't want to see them. Uh, it's very important that like you don't see multiple at once because you have to get rid of them. And if Dromai plays multiples, you can't get rid of all of them in like one turn without expending all of your resources. And so, which, which ruins your tempo plan. And so they draw into these power cards because they're cycling through things, but also because they have resources, you can't gum them up. So they like play Tome, draw, hit Chromai, play Chromai, and now I can't pop to end their turn, shoot a dragon to end their turn, uh, and I can't frostbite them out of their turn. So all of a sudden, this tightrope of tempo that I've been like balancing the whole time, they just shoot me off the tightrope. <laughs> they just like knock me off and there's nothing I can do about it. And they have three copies. Uh, and since it's drawing cards, it's drawing them into more copies of Tome. So the matchup, which I thought was going to get even better than 75-25, is now so much worse I'm 03. They cut the rope. That's a much better. That's a much better. Yes. Thank you. Azir. I just said they cut the rope. Um, all of a sudden I'm losing all the time. Like every game, the way I used to play the matchup just is no longer working. And I have to get on the plane to Barcelona in like 12 hours. And I'm panicking, <laughs> panicking. Cause we expect Dromai to be the most played deck by a good margin. Uh, and if all of a sudden my matchup into Dromai went from like, quite good to really bad, I'm in trouble. Because Icelander has a lot of other not super great matchups, right? Like you don't want to really see Dash. There's this new Dash IO deck that we have to see what's going on with that, right? And so I got to get on the plane and I'm panicking. Now I'm talking to um, the people I'm going to be testing with, which is mostly uh, Sasha Markovic and um, Peter Bedensic, otherwise known as Giga Chad Peter. If you've ever watched the story times, Peter, I know you're watching this. Um, and I'm like, oh no, guys, like <laughs> this isn't working. Um, so we're kind of like theorying or whatever, theorying. And we go, okay, don't worry about it. We're going to get to Barcelona. Uh, I'm going to get to Barcelona at like Tuesday morning, like 8.30 a.m. And then we don't have to start playing till Friday morning. So we have like three full days of testing to do, right? We'll figure it out. And so I bring like a Droma deck, I bring an Icelander deck, I bring like some other decks like Dash.io. I get on the plane, it's like 20 hours of traveling, which is miserable. And I have like three hours of sleep, maybe, because I had to get up to drive to San Francisco at like 4.30 a.m. Uh, and I just couldn't fall asleep. I didn't end up falling asleep till like 1.32 a.m. So I got, I have no sleep. I have to drive two hours to San Francisco, get on a bunch of planes, fly to Barcelona. Uh, I'm going to spare you the expense of talking about the actual traveling. Just know that it wasn't awesome. I got on the plane um, and I was just going to read some like web series on my phone and the plane didn't have Wi-Fi. So that sucked. Um, but I land in Barcelona and I see the boys, which is going to be like Austin Yost uh, and Peter Bedensic. And then Flake uh, or Matt DeMarco. So they're there. They grab me. We grab a cab to our hotel. Very nice hotel, by the way. Um, incredible view out the window. Just really nice. Very close to like the convention center. I don't know exactly where it is in Barcelona, but it's right next to the convention center. And it's very, very nice. So very happy with that. Um, and immediately I'm like, all right, bros. <laughs> like, <laughs> We got to play some games. So we have to like... The, the issue with trying to play a tournament overseas is that you have a limited time to get your jet lag issues fixed, right? The tournament starts Friday morning. It's Tuesday morning. I haven't slept in a very long time. I've been traveling and I'm nine hours off my time zone. So I have to get that figured out and situated before the tournament starts. Because if you try to play like a world championship, you know, over the board game or whatever, uh, while jet lagged, it's not going to go your way. 
it's going to be miserable. And so we're like, we have to stay up until the evening, right? We can't fall asleep until at least like 7 p.m. So we head over to uh, Saucer Markovich and Brendan Patrick's Airbnb, where we're going to be doing most of our testing. Um, I meet Sasha for like the first time. I've talked to him a little bit, but this is the first time I've actually met him. Gem of a person. I really like him. He's a really cool guy. <laughs> He's like just a pleasure to be around. I really like Sasha a lot. Um, and so we, we start testing. And I'm like, Sasha, bro, like, He's already starting to jam Dromai games because we think Dromai is the best deck and he's never played it. And I'm like, Sasha, dude, I need to play Icelander versus Dromai, right? Um, and so we sit down and we start playing and I get bodied just over and over and over and over again. I'm just getting lit up and I'm just, just sinking into despair, right? But out of nowhere comes a message from someone I've never talked to before. Um, a Canadian. And um, it says, hey, I got you. Darkodius said to send this to you. It's an Icelander deck. It's an Icelander deck from Yasker, uh, Michael Yasker. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and I open it up and instead of the nine Phantasm poppers that it plays, that we've been playing, it plays 15 Phantasm Poppers. Now, if you don't play Flesh and Blood, you're like, yeah, okay, words. I don't know what that means. Understand that in a wizard deck is like the most insane thing you've ever heard of in your entire life. We're digging deep into Draft Chaff to find these cards to play. Um, it's playing Down and Dirties. <laughs> it's playing Rampaging Bronhide or like whatever it's talking about. Wh whatever that card's called. Braging Bronhide, maybe? I don't know. Um, it's, yeah, it's Bravo Lander. <laughs> uh, and so we're like, okay, we'll test this out. And we start winning a little bit more. But I'm like, I don't know, guys. Like, this doesn't feel like it. This isn't feeling like we're going to be winning. I don't know. It just, it just feels like we're trying not to lose as much instead of, like, actually trying to win. And I keep pushing that I think, like, arcane spells are really good. But I can't quite make it work. I'm like, okay, we, we want like tall arcane damage because we need to be doing damage to them. And attacks just aren't working because competent Dromize now can just block a lot and just wait for their power hands with Tome. And then they like kick you in the face once they draw Tome. Uh, whereas before they had to keep two to three card hands in order to get anything done. And you just didn't care because if you're sending an attack and they're blocking with two cards, they're leaking damage. And then on their turn, you frostbite them and you're leaking damage just to like get them to play just for them to play anything. Right. And like you just eventually just kill them. But now with Tome, that's not really an issue. So they just block a bunch, maybe play one card. You try to like freeze them up a bit. They're like, OK, they block a little bit more damage. And eventually they just find Tome and, and flip the board. Right. Uh, and so I'm like, I don't know if this 15 popper list is good. I really want like arcane damage, but I can't quite get it to work because we're not doing enough damage and they're overrunning us. So we probably played like 20 Draw My Icelander games at this point, just like in a day or two or like a day and a half. Let's just say like a day. The first day we probably played 12, right? Uh, we're trying the 15 poppers. We're doing everything we can. And it just feels like we're losing a little bit less hard. Uh, it's time for us to head back to the Airbnb. We're all exhausted, right? We've been traveling. I've slept like two and a half hours over like a 48 hour period of time. Uh, and I just crash. I crash. We all fall asleep. And we fall asleep at like 8 p.m., maybe 8.30, and we wake up at like noon. <laughs> so we sleep for a very long time. <laughs> I think we ended up sleeping for like 15 hours or something ridiculous um, and wasted half of the day. But I had to like try to catch up on my jet lag. So that's what we did. Wake up. We head back out there. And today we're doing a little bit of drafting as well because World Championships and Pro Tours and stuff for Flesh and Blood are a mix of constructed play and limited play. I hate that. <laughs> I don't really like limited play. Um, I feel like it's it's annoying, but um, whatever. I have to practice it, so we do. We buckle down. We get to practicing. Uh, our first pod, <laughs> we have... So there's like three heroes you can play in this limited set. Think of them like Colors and Magic the Gathering, but if there's only three, right? Uh, and all eight people in the pod played Tech Levasin, which is like not supposed to happen. And I thought that was really funny. So if you played, if you played this Flesh and Blood limited format, that'll give you a bit of a chuckle. Uh, but enter Pankaj. So we're still struggling with this draw by matchup. 
We can't get a dork. 15 poppers feels like too many. So currently we're doing 12 and we're trying to fit something else in. We're cutting cards that were previously like really, really good against Dromai, like Enlightened Strike. Historically, one of the best cards against Dromai for any deck. We're like cutting it in the matchup to make room for our poppers and not have too many reds. We just like can't. We can't play that many reds. Um, so Pankaj comes, or Ethnic Smoke, he actually commented, commentated, uh, did some of the casting for the World Championships. Icelander player, like myself, uh, we've worked on decks previously. So he comes to help us draft and like do kind of stuff. And he's like, hey, I'm winning against Dromai. And this man has like six poppers and pretty tall arcane damage. And we're like, okay, that's so weird because like, I don't think with six poppers, you'd be able to hold on. And so he plays a couple of games and we're watching him and we're like backseating both sides. And then I play a couple of games with his list and Peter plays a couple of games with his list. And what we figure out is that the real key in the matchup now with Tome, since Droma has Tome, is you have to keep Channel Lake Frigid for two turns. You have to. If your Channel Lake Frigids aren't staying around for two turns, you get ran over. But if they are, you can win. And then the other issue we found is that our list, since we have so many attacks, it's almost impossible for us to keep Channel Lake Frigid for two turns. Because you have one card to pitch for your attacks. Your attacks are incredibly efficient. You play the most efficient attacks in the game. So it's just two cards. One's the attack, one's the resource card. And in order to keep Channel Lake Frigid around for two turns, you have to get two ice cards in your resource pile called the pitch, the pitch zone. Um, and the attacks don't let you do that because you can't over pitch. I can't pitch six resources when I only need three. Um, and there's some finagling, but just, just pretend that that's true. So we can't keep Channel Lake Frigid around. And then when we do keep Channel Lake Frigid around, all we're doing is sending an attack. And since our opponent is taxed out of their mind due to the Channel Lake Frigid, they just block and just wait for your Channel Lake Frigid to go away, right? So what we end up doing is we end up on a card called Ice Bolt. Now, Ice Bolt, we're already playing as a blue, the big resource one, but we're not playing it as a red. Yeah, Channel Lake Frigid is the landmark that increases all the opponent's stuff by one. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Ice Bolt is not being played as a red. When Icelander wants to be playing more arcane spells, they lean into Red Aether Hail because it's more efficient. With one pitch card and Red Aether Hail, you get four arcane damage from the Aether Hail and two from your weapon, which costs two resources. So you pitch a three resource card, you get you spend one on the hail to do four, and two on your weapon to deal two, making six, right? Red Ice Bolt does five for two resources. But the issue is that you can't go Ice Bolt weapon with one resource card because it costs four and resource cards blues max out. They, they only give you three, right? So you'd need an extra card, but we already determined that the most important part of the draw my matchup is keeping channel Lake frigid around for two turns and then presenting arcane instead of physical damage while they're under channel Lake frigid. What ice bolt let us do by purposefully being inefficient is it let us cast ice bolt pitching an ice card, and then pitch another ice card to weapon, giving us the two ice cards needed in our pitch zone to keep our channel like frigid around, right? And because the draw my deck is basically all reds, it's nigh unblockable damage. It's like almost impossible for them to block any of it. So you're basically just dealing direct damage while keeping them completely frozen up. And that is how we kind of like fix the matchup. So our final build of Icelander was nine poppers. We board out Enlightened Strikes against Dromai, and we bring in the Red Ice Bolts. And I was very happy, very happy with this list. We were also playing three copies of Winter's Grasp, which is like a really shitty blue ice attack because it could attack. It would, you have like a all four blue hand. You could like send Winter's Grasp at one of the important dragons to kill them without like really losing any tempo or big cards. Um, and we were really happy with our final build of Icelander. So we just keep testing. Uh, we do some more drafts and stuff. We get prepared. And I'm feeling really good, actually. I think our constructed deck's insane. I think it's, like, very, very, very good. Uh, we're very prepared for a lot of different matchups. We tested things like Dash IO into Icelander, where we were fatiguing Dash, which, as a wizard, that never happens. You never fatigue people as a wizard. Um, our Bravo matchup's a buy. I feel incredible in the mirror, right? If there's anything I know how to do, it's how to play spell decks in the mirror. Um, and so we practiced the mirror bunch. We practiced drum. I have million times. Uh, we practiced against Reinar. We practiced against a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of stuff. And I felt very good. We put in some serious reps on draft. I felt good like that. And so we head to 
the world championships. Um, we get there, we turn in our deck list or whatever, um, and we sit down from our round one opponent. And my round one opponent flips up Reinar. Now, here's something about Reinar. People will tell you that Reinar is very good into Icelander, and they're wrong. Icelander is very good into Reinar. The only thing is, every now and then, Reinar is going to high roll the shit out of you. And it feels so bad <laughs> that you think it's a bad matchup, but it only happens like one out of five times. The other four times, you, you're just the much more efficient deck. And you have Storm Striders, which is a wizard equipment that basically lets you like do one thing on your opponent's turn, uh, which kind of like steals a turn. So when they try to kill you, you can kill them in response with Storm Striders. Um, and Reiner is like a horribly inefficient deck. But they have one card called Blood Rush Bellows. Blood Rush Bellows costs one mana. It discards a random card in your hand. If it's a six or more power card, they draw two cards and all their brute attacks get plus two plus get plus two for the entire turn. Whenever you discard a six power card, uh, you intimidate, which basically means you shuffle up your hand, your opponent picks one, and then that card gets like banished until the end of uh, until the end of your opponent's turn. It makes it harder for you to block profitably. Uh, now, the trick for Reinar is to not respect Blood Rush Bellows too much. People get really scared, and they choose to go first against Reinar. Now, first is a big tempo loss because you get to draw back up at the end of your at the end of both players draw back up at the end of turn zero, uh, as opposed to normally where you only draw back up after your turn. So if you go first, you get to block with your entire hand and then draw your hand back up. Very efficient. So generally attacking into the turn zero player isn't even like attacking as the turn zero player isn't even that good, right? But if you go second and you send an attack and your opponent blocks, they don't get those cards back to attack you with. So it's the much more tempo positive play to go second. Now, it does matter in different matchups where like sometimes there's decks to play a bunch of permanents like Dromai and you don't want them to go first because they get free permanents and you start off behind. But usually going second is better in Flesh and Blood. Um, so a lot of people respect Blood Rush Bellows too much and they choose to go first because they're worried about getting their hand intimidated and taking a bunch of damage. You should be going second against Reinar as Icelander because you start off tempo high. Usually they're like not going to do any damage to you every now and then they do a little bit of damage not a big deal so i win the die roll and i say i'm gonna go second <laughs> um feeling really good ready to run this goddamn tournament we shuffle up i draw my hand pretty good hand my opponent sits there and stares at his hand for a while now if you're going first there's not a lot of decisions to make you can decide, hey, I'm either going to like make an attack or I'm not going to make an attack. I'm just going to end the turn and allow my opponent to start. I'm just going to end the turn arsenal because I don't want my opponent to like filter their hand, right? Um, but my opponent's sitting there staring at his hand a bunch, which means they're thinking they want to do something. And the only thing they could possibly want to do is cast Blood Rush Bellows. But the problem with casting Blood Rush Bellows on turn zero is if it doesn't go very well, you waste the only card in the matchup that matters for no gain, right? So he's sitting there, and he shuffles his hand, and then he just kind of shrugs, and he goes, Blood Rush Bellows? And I go, yep. Resolves, and I'm thinking, this is pretty good. Maybe I take, like, three damage, and we're chilling. Right, it's just a four-card hand. It's not even a five-card hand. I'll take a couple damage. He'll be out of Blood Rush Bellows, and then we'll, like, really just, like, hammer it. Um, and so my opponent shuffles his hand. I pick one card for him to discard, and he discards a card, draws his two cards, and he goes, ah, that's not good. And I'm like, let's go. We just won the game on the spot. Haven't even taken a turn yet. And so he kind of sits there and like, I have one card down. I have three cards to block with because one card got intimidated. Um, and he's just kind of like, oh man, just hemming and hawing for a while, right? Just kind of thinking. He like attacks with a claw for five. Or sorry, he doesn't attack with a claw for five. He casts Savage Feast, which is a six power attack that discards a card. If you discard a card with six, you draw a card, Right? And so he shuffles up his hand, I pick one, and he flips it, 
and it's a six power attack with special text. <laughs> when this card is discarded, gain one resource. <laughs> and he gets to draw from Savage Feast. And I get intimidated. So I lose another card. And he draws. And he goes... And I'm like, no, <laughs> come on, bro. He went from, that's not good, to like perking up in his chair and everything. So this attack's coming in for eight. I block as much as I can. I take like two or whatever, two or three. Um, and I can't block anymore for the turn. And then he goes like, claw you for five. So I've taken, what is that like? Yeah, eight damage. I've taken eight damage. He claws me for five, pitching a blue, and then his last card is Swing Big, which attacks for 10. <laughs> so I've taken 18 damage on turn zero. It's pretty standard on turn zero for you to take zero damage. My hero starts with less HP. So I only have 36 health. I take 18 damage on turn zero against this Reinar. I'm starting the game 18 to 40. <laughs> I start the game halfway down on life total and then unfortunately i draw my i get my two cards back they're not the cards i wanted to keep and i draw two more cards and they don't do anything <laughs> so i basically like pass the turn back to my opponent without like really doing anything and they start sending attacks at me and stuff so i'm trying to like set up trying to get the game going and i'm like making a real show of it yeah like, I'm, I'm fighting back in here. Because, like I said, Icelander is very good into Reinar. Um, you're just way more efficient than them. I'm never letting him keep, a, like, a five-card hand so he can't get, like, a good blood rush on me again. Um, I'm sending my attacks and stuff. And then there comes a point in the game where I have Insidious Chill set up and Red Aether Ice Vein in my arsenal. Now, if you don't play Icelander, just understand that I basically have the one-two punch that's going to remove all tempo from my opponent's side. I'm going to deal a bunch of damage, and I'm going to strip their whole hand. And with no hand, they're not going to be able to come after me, right? So what I need is I need my opponent with their three-card hands or whatever, three or four-card hands, to just send one attack. Now, outside of Blood Rush Bellows and possibly Enlightened Strike... Reinar never sends more than one attack. It's just one. Because the deck doesn't really do anything outside of that. Um, and most of the Reinar lists aren't even playing in Lightning Strike. So it's basically like my opponent has to draw the third copy of Blood Rush Bellows. Or I'm going to win the game. Even through this entire deficit. Or CNC. Well, CNC is just one attack. I block two and then I win the game. Because I cast Aether Ice Vein. Um, like, a CNC is going to be fine. But... <laughs> Then my opponent, the next turn, I draw up. I have six block, six or seven block, right? Because I, I think I may have like a defense reaction. And then I have like the ice card in the blue to do the Aether Ice Vein and just like tear apart the game. My opponent's low at like 13, right? So like if I stick this Aether Ice Vein, I win the game. Um, and my opponent draws a four card hand, no arsenal, and just goes, Enlightened Strike, go again? <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, because this basically means that they get to go Enlightened Strike, give it go again. Send another attack. That's two attacks. So I have to block with my whole hand. Unfortunate, but it's okay. We have another shot. There's like no cards in my opponent's deck that allows them to attack with two cards. So I draw my four cards. Again, it's a hand that can aether ice vein my opponent. They draw their four cards, four brand new ones, and they go, Enlighten Strike, go again. <laughs> Send six. I have to block with my whole hand again. That's pretty unlucky. But surely this time, they don't have another Enlightened Strike. There's only one left. So I drop my four cards, and guess what my opponent does? Enlightened Strike, go again? Eight you. Fucking throw my whole hand again. <laughs> again. And then three in a row. And then finally, my opponent draws the third Blood Rush Bellows. And I lose the game. And that's how we start the world tournament. Down zero to one by getting high rolled out of my boots on turn zero. And then still almost winning the game multiple times in a row. If only my opponent had one normal Reinar hand. And I was like, bummed, bro. Bummed. It's like, God damn it. This sucks. Right? I like, I should have won this game. At least first round's best of one. All flesh and blood is best of one. 
uh, which sounds horrible until you play Flesh and Blood, and then you get it. Because you see, like, your whole deck, usually. So, and they're very long. A lot of decisions. It doesn't feel very swingy. Except for this. This was swingy. Uh, so I just get out variance. Whatever. Time to shake it off. Time to make the run. Um, so second round opponent. I sit across from a dash. Not a good matchup. You don't really want to see dash as Icelander. But like I played against a lot of dashes. And I beat a lot of dashes. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not super worried. I'm like yeah. You know what? I got this. I can win this. Um, same thing. Set up Insidious Chill. I'm just kind of blocking out. My opponent starts Pounder. Teclo Pounder. So they're just like pushing damage, pushing damage, pushing damage. Uh, now the important card against Dash is also Channel Leaf Frigid, just like against Dromai. Uh, and so I'm just kind of like biding my time, looking for it, trying to find a spot to stick this Red Aether Ice Vein. So I have Red Aether Ice Vein in my hand, and I'm like, oh, finally. I get to play this. <laughs> um, now there's a card in Dash called um, Pulse Wave Harpoon. Which basically is like, if you boost enough times, for however many times you boosted, your opponent has to show you that many cards. And then you can pick one and force them to block with it, right? I have a four-card hand. And my opponent's boosting twice, and they have like a resource left or two resources left or whatever. And I'm like, okay, I need to play around Pulse Wave Harpoon here. So I look at my hand, and it's like, red attack, blue block three, blue block three. Sorry, it's Red Aether Ice Vein, um, blue, blue block three, blue block three, Blizzard. Now, the issue is that if Blizzard was any other card, it's fine. Because my opponent only boosted three times. But And so I could show them the three cards that aren't the Aether Ice Vein. They pick one of those, and then I Aether Ice Vein them with Insidious Chill and just like completely steal tempo from the game. But Blizzard literally cannot block... <laughs> I had to I had to cast it or something to not die. Um, but basically, I end up with three exact cards that I can show my opponent. Um, they Pulse Wave Harpoon me, and I show my three exact cards, and they pick the Aether Ice Vein out of it, right? And I go, okay, that's fine. It really sucks because now my hand's, like, super inefficient, and I can't, like, take control of the game. And I leak a bunch of damage because I let the damage in so that I could Aether Ice Vein, and now I can't even do that. So I draw my next hand, and it's another Aether Ice Vein, and I was like, yo, let's go because I have six, right? Uh, not counting the blue ones. Those don't count. I have six. And my opponent goes like, boost card, boost card, pulse wave harpoon, steal your Aether Aether Ice Vein again. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so I drop again, Aether Ice Vein. <laughs> and my opponent goes, boost card, boost card. Sorry, it's like, card that gets back an attack from your graveyard. Sack it, get pulse wave harpoon, boost card, boost card, pulse wave harpoon, take your Aether Ice Vein. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> but so i <laughs> i have lost my chance to like completely steal the game three turns in a row um and it, i'm just waiting for a channel like frigid just waiting we're like halfway through our decks just waiting for a channel like frigid and then we keep playing a little bit my opponent's pounder runs out obviously because that's how that works um and they cast this card that's called bios update and BIOS update is like plus three. Uh, if you boost an item, you get to put the item onto the field for free. And so <laughs> they BIOS update. And that's not the part that really matters. The part that really matters is that it's just plus three to your next attack, right? And so they BIOS update and they boost. <laughs> and I'm like still kind of about to come back into this game. But they BIOS update and they boost <laughs> and they boost away Teclo Pounder. <laughs> So they just get to put another Teclo Pounder out on the field for free. <laughs> Finally got rid of the last one. Finally, like, getting away from this tempo. Second Teclo Pounder for free. Dope. And then they boost again, start dealing more damage. And I'm just, like, trying to find Channel Lake Frigid. And I just can't. So I'm basically just, like, blocking, 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 blocking. Still got my opponent down to, like, 16 or something. Um, and I'm about to hit my pitch deck, which means, like, the last cards of my deck. And I draw my last hand. <laughs> And it's like, card, card, card. And the last card is Channel Lake Frigid. One Channel Lake Frigid. And I'm like, that's weird. I'm like really close to my pitch deck. So I finally draw Channel Lake Frigid, and my opponent forces me to block with it. Um, and then I end up dying. And I look at the next like three cards, three or four cards. I just pick them up, and it's Channel Lake Frigid, Channel Lake Frigid, card, my pitch deck. 
So all three channel link frigids were in the last four cards of my deck. The big powerhouse card that really like wins me in the matchup. Last four cards in my deck, all three copies. So I'm just like, I'm 0-2. And, and I feel miserable. I put in so much effort. And like I lost games that were incredibly winnable just because like just got hit with the wrong side of variance, right? And it happens, it does, uh, but it feels really bad because the last Pro Tour I played for Flesh and Blood, I went 0-4 because of the same thing. I punted one game, and then I went 0-3 just for unwinnable games, and I felt terrible. Uh, but I put way more practice into this one, and I felt way better about it, and then I start off 0-2, and I'm like, oh, man, I've worked so hard. I've worked so hard, and... I couldn't, I couldn't, if I went back in time to play these games again, I'd still lose them. Uh, just like if I shuffled, you know, it's just that feeling where like, if you, sh if I shuffled one more time, I win these games. Um, and so it sucks. Oh, and two, my buddy, Alex Vore is also oh, and two, but did, he's hyped. Cause that guy's never been in a bad mood in his entire life. He's just like, yeah, oh, and two, we're submarining. Like they're counting us out. We got this just nice guy love being around him very funny guy um and so i'm like all right shake it off like let's just let's just play i feel i feel like i'm in a good spot for this tournament still i play my round three opponent it's a bravo which is like really unfortunate for my opponent because that matchup is basically unlosable um i blast him and then my round four opponent is on dromai yeah finally we play a dromai um the one we prepared for i don't really want to play against a dromai but i prepared for it so we start playing the game, blah, 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 blah. I'm casting my ice veins. I'm blocking. I'm not really attacking with my attacks because my opponent just blocks and I feel sad. Um, and I cast Channeling Frigid and I keep it around for a turn and I arsenal my Red Aether Ice Bolt to keep it around for two turns. So it's my turn again and I have two cards in my hand plus my Red Aether Ice Bolt and I go, Ice Bolt you? And I pitch an Ice card and he looks at the card because people don't play Red Aether Ice Bolt. Or Red Ice Bolt. People, he looks at the card, and he looks at me, and he goes, I guess I'll take five. And then I pitch another ice card to my weapon, and he goes, I guess I'll take two more. And I'm like, and then I keep channeling Frigid around, and he's like, man, that's really good. <laughs> and I felt so vindicated <laughs> that like my plan for the matchup or whatever had worked out. Um, and I like, I, I made up for some of my bad luck in the first two rounds. I blast this guy, just blast him. So we finished a constructed portion of worlds two and two. Um, and we move on to the draft portion. And I end up drafting Teclavasin. Um, and my draft deck is quite good, actually. I'm like, oh, I could 3-0 this pod. Like, my Tecla deck is solid. I match up into Dash uh, my first round. And we play for, like, 11 turns, I think. I go first. It really wasn't. It was good. It was good enough. It really was. Um... You and Peter had like the most mid Tecla decks. That's good enough to 3 0. <laughs> in my pod, dude, I saw the other decks. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this Tecla deck could have 3 0'd. Um, and so I start, I drop my hand, and I just pass priority to my opponent. And he's playing Dash IO. And if you don't know how Dash IO works, they can play cards off the top of their deck, but only if it's an item card. Now, item cards have drawbacks, and mainly that they don't block at all. So if you have a lot of item cards in your deck and you're drawing them instead of finding them off the top, it's not very good for you, right? Now, I think my opponent had something like 16 items, like an insane amount, so that when I'm attacking them, they shouldn't really be able to block very much. Um, but I don't know that at the time. So I like pass priority, maybe play an Evo or something, and my opponent like pitches and plays an item off the top. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty lucky. All right, item on turn zero, that's pretty good. And then they go to their turn. They take the item down. It's like boom grenade or something. And they play another boom grenade. And then they attack and boost. So how boom grenade works is if I get hit with an attack, 
they blow up and I take a bunch more damage. It's going to be like eight damage, right? So what I'm going to do is just block, right? I'm just going to block out my opponents like two attacks or something. And I'm just not going to worry about the boom grenades. They're going to go away. And then my opponent's just not going to have enough damage in their deck to finish me off. Um, so they like boost. They're attacking for like five. No, three. Sorry. They're boosting. They're attacking for three. Uh, and I block three. And there's no combat tricks really in this set. But there is a rare card item that says um, your mechanologist attack action cards get plus one. Plus one attack. And it's an item. You can't play it at like instant speed unless you're dash IO and it's on top of the deck. <laughs> so my opponent hits like item on top of the deck on turn zero, item on their turn, attacks me, banishes an odd item card, finds an item on top. And that item, I call it channel mech heroic. I don't know what it's actually called. I can't remember. That item is channel mech heroic, which he flips off the top, gives plus one damage to his mech attacks, hits me for one, and gets to blow up the boom grenade. Yeah, penetration script. Flips penetration script. Blows up the boom grenades. Absolutely blows me out. Absolutely blows me out. Pretty unlucky. Because I have things that can block, like, the evasive mechanic in the set. Like, in my deck, I have, like, six ways. Five or six ways to block it. Uh, I have one in my hand. So I'm, like, ready to deal with, like, the, the basically the elusive mechanic of the set. Um, which is, like, overpower, I think. Um, but I'm just not ready for this combat trick that like you're not supposed to have. You'd have to like you have to have it in your deck, and you have to get like very very lucky to have it on top. Um, so I get blown out, and then <laughs> and then my opponent like sets up another item off the top on my turn, uh, and then draws like goes to their turn, plays a boom grenade, <laughs> attacks, boosts the card off the top, it has to go again, and I block <laughs> enough to not get hit with the boom grenade, and off the top comes the other item that messes with combat math. Everything that your opponent blocks with, all attack action cards that your opponent blocks with, get minus one defense, or all action cards or something. They flip it off the top, boom grenades go off, blows me out again. And at this point, there's just no coming back. Reverse polarity script. Thank you, Dark Codius. He actually reads the cards. Um, I just get, like, super blown out just twice in a row, and I die, and there's nothing I can really do about it. So I'm, like, two and three once again feeling miserable right um i can still play because four and oh makes it to the four and three makes it to the next day so i keep playing uh my next matchup i it just like I, I think i win that one so i'm like three and three yeah i win that one i'm three and three i played like a tech Lemire or max or something i don't remember um and then the last round i'm playing and like it just does not line up <laughs> it just does not line up for me and I end up losing. And I go three and four. Three and four out of Worlds contention. They use the PTI for Worlds? Yeah. Unless you're like top 50 ELO in the world, you have to use a PTI for Worlds. Um, so I'm three and four. I'm out of Worlds. And all my preparation just gone. And I feel terrible. I feel not good. Um, part of it was that like, I wasn't sleeping very well. I was sleeping like four or five hours a day outside of the first day that I got back and slept for like 15. So I just, I took it harder than normal. Um, cause it feels really bad when you pour like all that time and effort into it. And then things just don't line up. Right. Um, and that's how I felt. I felt like if we played the tournament again, I'd have a much better result. I don't know that that's true, right? Um, but I whined a bit. <laughs> I was definitely doing a bit of whining. Yeah, I just got blown out, and, I, and there was nothing I could do about it, I felt like. Um, just hit the wrong side of variance. It happens. It's a card game, right? I definitely hit the right side of variance sometimes. I hit the right side of variance against that Dromai guy I played where I just, like, blasted him. Nothing he could do about that. Um, but the next event's a calling, which is basically a Grand Prix, if you ever played Magic. Now, the issue is that the calling is sealed and sealed is the worst format ever invented <laughs> sealed's limited you already know i don't like limited is there a way to get the deck list for ice Lander? yeah remind me after and i can send it to you um sealed is limited and i don't like limited very much i liked limited in magic the gathering but limited in flesh and blood sucks um it's not very flexible and you don't have a lot of extra cards so there's not really any deck building you do 
It's just like you do your draft and you cut the worst of the unplayable cards and you have to play the others. Um, so I don't really like Flesh and Blood very much. Flesh and Blood drafting very much. And Sealed is even worse than drafting. In this particular set, you open up four packs and you just hope to get something playable. And if you don't, you're fucked. And there's like nothing you can do about it. And the calling is eight rounds with this sealed pool. Um, so you're kind of just hoping. And in sealed, there's usually one hero that's like strictly better than all the others. And in sealed, it's Tecla Boston. I do think Dash is like very, very, very good in the draft. Uh, in sealed, not so much. You need very specific cards to make Dash or Max good. You don't need, and you need very specific cards to be able to play Teclo, but you don't need specific cards to make Teclo good. You just have to have what's called Evos, a couple of them. Um, in order to turn on his weapon. So I open my sealed pool, and I'm looking through, and I don't have the Evos to play Teclavossin, which is already bad, but hopefully I have a max deck or a dash deck. So I look through, and I have nothing. I've got nothing. My items are terrible. I can't play dash. I have no pumps. I can't play max. And I have no Evos. So I can't play Tech Boston. Now, normally what I do here is just play a mid-range max deck and try to get there, which is what I ended up doing. However, you really need like strong red attacks to be able to play something like that. And I have one card that attacks for six in my entire pool, which is horrible. Horrible. So I put together the best I can. I go and I consult with friends build the best sealed deck I can out of my pool. They all agree. Yes, I think it should be this way. Big Bertha, no reds. No red berths. Um, now, my saving grace, possible saving grace, is that I have one overload script, which is some form of evasion, and I have one overpower card. It's yellow, uh, which can get some damage in. Now, the issue is I don't have pumps, and I don't have boom grenades, so I can't like add extra damage onto my elusive thing. I can only get a little bit because my deck sucks. <laughs> so I sit down. I'm against a Tekla Boston, which means that they're just going to try to fatigue me. They're just going to run me out of cards, play very defensively. Um, I sit down, and I need um, Torque Tuned, which is my overpower attack, and I need my overload script. But the mechanic of the set is boost, which is basically like you play a card, and you can give it go again by ripping something off the top of your deck and putting it in like the Banish Zone. It goes away forever. Um but as Max, it's like you have to be doing it a lot. It's like very important for the deck. So uh, I boost and I boost away Overload Script. And I'm like, fuck, man. Now I only have one source left of Overpower to like get any damage in against this Tekla Boston. I have to be really, really smart about how I do this. <laughs> so then the next turn comes around and I boost and I boost my Torque Tuned. <laughs> so I no longer have any form of like evasion to get damage in. And I don't have the damage in my deck to kill my opponent because my sealed pool sucks. So I start off 0-1. Uh, I end up rattling off a couple wins. I think I'm like 2-1 um, before I sit down and play against like a dash that tries to fatigue me and does. <laughs> now dash normally doesn't fatigue because they have like items which don't block and dash starts at a lower life total. But it didn't matter because every single card of my opponent's deck was better than mine. And so they fatigued me and I died. I'm two and two. Uh, sit down against someone else, win. Sit down against someone else. And they have a techno pile that's got bigger attacks than me. And I lose. Um, and I'm not spending a bunch of time on the games because they don't really matter. In the sealed pool, the calling. Um, just understand that it felt really, really, really bad again. Because it was another spot where like I did all I could do. I felt like, um, but if my opponent's sealed pools were better than mine, I could not beat them because I just didn't have the tools in my sealed pool. Uh, I, ju I just didn't, I didn't have a way to get the damage I needed to win games. Like I was getting fatigued by heroes that shouldn't be able to fatigue you because I just, I just, I didn't have the pieces. So I'm like three and three. I'm not, I can't even make day two. No one to fix all your problems to Barcelona Metro. Yeah, I don't think that's true. Uh, I'm three and three. I can't make day two. So I drop out of the calling. And again, I'm just feeling miserable. That's two. The two big tournaments in a row are, um, are gone. And I didn't get anything out of it. I have losing records. Like I couldn't make it happen. 
And I'm sure I could have played better. I definitely could have played better in the sealed in the calling, but like not better enough that it would have bailed me out <laughs> or anything, which is what feels so bad is that I felt like I lost and I, no matter what, I couldn't have done anything to like to win enough. Um, so I was probably just like a super big wet blanket <laughs> on all of my friends. And I feel really bad about that. Uh, but we have another tournament. We have the Runeterra Open. <laughs> the Runeterra Eternal Open is, is that night. So obviously we go get a drink or two and I pull out my phone and I start playing the Runeterra Open with Yost and Peter. Uh, I end up registering just random ass fucking decks, man. I haven't played Eternal. So I end up registering Rise, Trundle Set, <laughs> and Aphelios Victor. And I'm crushing them, man. I'm like 5-0. and oh. I am like running this thing. Um, and I run into someone who has like an incredible lineup against me. Like an incredible lineup. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, that sucks. So I ban one of their decks, try to get there, don't. Lose a game, whatever, 5-1. Play a couple more. Um, I'm seven and one. And I just need to win two before I lose two. Right. And I mash up into the same guy <laughs> on the super counter lineup. And I'm like, God damn it. Uh, I try to get there again. Don't. And just lose seven and two. I only need to win two more. Uh, I play another one. And I matched up into some good matchups, I believe. I can't remember exactly what the, the matchups were, but I believe it was like, I wasn't feeling bad about it at all. And so I like queue up Rise and do the Rise thing where you like have a million Delves in your deck and then like don't draw them. And I lose the game. And then I'm playing against Jana Nila where like I basically won the game unless my opponent can present like 11 points of burn in like a six card hand. <laughs> so they like sunken temple their hand away. They had four cards. They sunken temple the four cards and they need to kill me that turn. And so I like put something on the stack and their hand that they sunken temple into was like, get excited, get excited. Mystic shot, mystic shot <laughs> for exactly lethal. No cards in hand. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> Come on, man. So I lose and I'm out of the open. And my God, this weekend is just not going my way. <laughs> I just cannot get things to line up. Um, so I lose world championships. Nothing. Lose the calling. Nothing. Lose the eternal open. That one's fair. I put zero practice into that. Nothing. But we have one more tournament left. <laughs> On Sunday, there's the battle hardened. It's living legend. Living legend format is everything that's already been there's, it's basically zero ban list. It's basically zero ban list format. Now, there's the big boogeyman of flesh and blood, and his name is Starvo. It's actually Bravo Star of the show, but we call him Starvo. Now, Starvo is by far the most busted thing that the game has ever, ever released. Not close. Um, especially when it gets access to all of its cards, like Awakening, which is fucked up. However, I don't really have all the cards because I didn't really play Starvo. And so I'm kind of scrambling to, like, get Starvo cards. And I pretty much get everything I need except one thing. I have to run Ironhide leggings or Ironhide legs or boots or whatever instead of the new Civic Steps. Now, Civic Steps blocks two and doesn't require a resource. Ironhide legs blocks two and does require a resource. So I don't have Civic Steps. But whatever. I'm just playing this tournament kind of for fun. There's like a pro tour invite at the top plus money and stuff. But, you know, like I said, just trying to have a good time. I start off like, I start off 2-0, doing good. And then I run into my third round opponent who was like, yo, man. <laughs> um, his name was uh, Lucas, I believe. Um, he's like, yo, man, I watch your content. What's going on, dude? I'm playing Lexi. And I was like, yo, that's so sick. That's very courageous of you <laughs> to play Lexi. And he's like, yeah, I love your story times. And since I know how this, not Lucas Oswald, no. Um, I love your story times. And since I know how they work, I know that either I'm going to beat you and I'm going to get a 20 minute segment <laughs> on how lucky I got. <laughs> or 
you're going to steamroll me, and I'll get 30 seconds. <laughs> so, I steamrolled his ass. <laughs> I just drew the nuts every turn, and he died. And there's your 30 seconds, Lucas. It was really nice playing against you. Hope the next time you play Living Legend format, it goes a little bit better for you. Um, so, I keep playing, and I keep winning. Uh, I'm like 4-0, I think. And then I played against um, another Starvo. And the mirror is super, super close. And I have a turn where basically if I can block two damage, if I can block two damage, then I can cast Awakening, get like a really big attack, um, and then I can keep Pummel and a blue in my hand. And my opponent's at like one. So basically, if I can block enough, I can checkmate my opponent is kind of what's happening here. And there's nothing they can do about it, uh, except for completely seeding tempo, in which case they're going to lose the game anyway. But the issue is, I need two resources to cast Awakening, one resource to activate my Crown of Seeds. Or sorry, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. One resource to activate Crown of Seeds, two resources to activate awakening that's just like how it had to work out but then if i spend another resource i have to get rid of another card to activate my boots so i'm sitting there and i'm mathing and i'm mathing and i'm mathing and i'm mathing and no matter how i do the math it just doesn't add up i have to spend the extra resource to block with my boots and i lose my pummel and i can't get as big of an attack but if I had civic steps, I could. So I do what I can, and I can't quite squeeze out the win because I didn't have civic steps. So I lose the game again because I didn't have the right boots. And I'm kind of upset about it, but whatever. I'm still X and 1. I need to X2 to top 8 or whatever. Um, I play another round. I win uh, against Fino Black, I think, playing Prism. I play another round. I win. Uh, against Prism again, I think. And then I play another round, and it's against Starvo, and the same thing happens. We get to the point where it's like really, really low to really, really low, and if I have Civic Steps, I win the game. But because I don't, I have to get rid of another card, and I lose all the tempo, and I die. So two games in a row, I lose because I didn't have Civic Steps. Uh, I play another game and I win. And then I play the last game match. There's nine goddamn rounds, by the way, of this tournament. Insane. Nine rounds and then cut to top eight. Uh, I play against a Prism. And my opponent goes first and just, like, double auras me. And then on my turn, he double auras me. And then I just never fuse. <laughs> and then I die. <laughs> So, like, that one wasn't close. I kind of got stomped on that one. There wasn't really anything I could do. Civic Steps wouldn't have saved me on that one. Um, and so I end up 6-3. and three. I'm the top, like, seeded X3. I end up getting a playmat. Whatever. But the moral of the story is I could not top 8 the event. Now, obviously, if I, like, won round 5, all my pairings are different. Everything would have been different. But it felt really bad to, like, lose two of the three matches that I lost just because I didn't have a, a certain card that I just, like, couldn't find before the event. Um, and that was the last tournament I played at Worlds. So to recap, three and four in the World Championships, three and three in the Calling, uh, seven and three in the Open, didn't make day two, and six and three in the Battle Hardened, didn't make top eight. Um, it was a rough, rough weekend for me. Uh, compounded by the fact that, again, I wasn't sleeping very well, so I felt very, like, snippy with people. Uh, I don't think very many people noticed, but like I was getting like very, very frustrated, obviously with how the weekend was going. Uh, and I have like, I'm a very introverted person. And so I can like, if I'm around people, especially when they're loud or things aren't going my way or I'm really hungry, um, I, my social battery like runs out and I just like kind of shut down. I just, like, need time to go do something by myself. I have to, like, go sit in a corner <laughs> and read a book or something for a while, right? Um, 
And so my social battery was just drained. <laughs> but the issue with like these, not, it, it's actually like one of the best parts of Flesh and Blood is that the community is very, very, very like intertwined. Um, and so you like know a lot of the people in the community. And so what would happen is it'd be like me and like three people. So it's like the four of us, you know, close friends or whatever. And we're going to go walk to go get dinner somewhere. Just a nice little quiet thing by ourselves. We go to the hotel lobby. There's three people in the hotel lobby. They see us. They're like, oh, what's up, guys? How are you doing? Um, you guys going to get dinner? Oh, we'll tag along. <laughs> so now we have seven people. And then we're walking down the street. And out of the bar walks two more people. And they're like, what's going on, guys? Oh, we're going to get dinner. All right, we'll tag along. So what ends up happening by the time you get to dinner is that instead of the four, the quiet four-person dinner you had planned, you have 11 fucking people. <laughs> you have two tables shoved together. Everyone's yelling it's loud, right? Everyone's having a good time except me because my social batteries, my social batteries drained and I had a pretty rough weekend and all I want to do is sit down by myself and I'm just like, I'm just struggling. <laughs> I'm just struggling. And that was kind of happened the whole weekend. It was never his fault. I love hanging out with everybody, but like I had constant headaches. I was really tired. And so like it was just getting to me. And then a bunch, a bunch of other stuff happened, but I don't want this to be a two hour YouTube video. So, um, Basically, say bye to everybody. Um, before I leave, I want to talk a bit about Barcelona, actually. Uh, Barcelona is very cheap. <laughs> it's really nice, but it's very cheap. And what was really funny is that the other people from other parts of the world did not think it was very cheap. So, like, we're standing there in the concession, like, stand or whatever, right, in the convention center. And so you're getting scammed, right? Like, it's, it's convention center food. Like you're paying, you're paying so much money <laughs> for no reason. Uh, that's just how, that's just how it works. Oh, you want a Coke? Okay. Well, that's going to be $6 or whatever. Right. Like in the States, when I go to get a water bottle, like just a normal sized water bottle or whatever, um, it's going to cost me $5. And so I go for at Barcelona or whatever, and we're there and I'm, yeah, I'm getting scanned out of my boots or whatever, but I'm standing next to some other European, some European guy who's like, oh my God, it's so expensive. And I'm like, I have like five things in my hands. I have like a bag of chips, a Coke, two glass water bottles, a salad. And I put it all up there and they're like, that'll be nine euros, please. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so cheap. <laughs> like I'm getting scammed and I'm thinking it's so cheap. We're at the, the mini bar in the hotel. We're like looking at the prices and I've gone on a rant about the mini bar before. I did not have mini bar price. Like I did not have mini bar privileges, but if I wanted like a Coke out of the mini bar, it cost $2, which is just how much a Coke cost here. So I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> this is so cheap. You wanted a beer three and a half dollars <laughs> from the mini bar. Right. We went out to dinner, which was pretty cheap in like a very, um, like tourist friendly type area. Um, so prices are going to be more expensive. It's two euros, not $2. I could do my own conversions. Thank you very much. Um, and we're sitting down and I'm eating dinner and I'm like, Oh, can I get like a vodka drink? Like something with some Tito's please. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and so they come and they have, they hand me this goblet with ice in it. Not a lot of ice, just a little bit because people in Europe don't like ice. I don't know why. Uh, they hand me this goblet. And he takes out the little, I think it's called, I don't know what it's called. I call it a decanter. I don't think that's the right word. It's the thing that's like a boop, boop, an hourglass shape. And on one side is a bigger shot and on the other side is the normal shot. And so he flips over the bigger shot one, the one that's like two ounces. And he pours the Tito's up into it to fill it all the way up and pours it into my, my glass. So that's like two ounces. And he flips it over and he pours it in. It's called a jigger. Oh, yeah. No wonder I avoid that word. That word scares me to say. Um, <laughs> and so he pours it into the one ounce, the one ounce thing, and he pours that into my glass. So I have like three ounces of vodka, which is like a little more than standard at a restaurant. Um, and, and then as he pours the one ounce one, he just like keeps pouring the Tito's while looking at me. So he like, you know, fills the two ounce, splashes it in, fills the one ounce, splashes it in. But instead of like lifting the bottle up, he just doesn't. He's just kind of holding, pouring, splashes the one ounce in. And then he just looks at me and he's kind of like, 
and just keeps pouring for a while and then stops. I have like five ounces of Tito's in this goblet. And then he hands me like a Sprite because that's for vodka soda. Hands me like a Sprite bottle, pops it open for me, right? Hands it to me. And people at the table, Flake's like, hey, how much does that drink cost? And I was like, I have no idea. And he's like, because you got hooked up. You know, like in the States, that'd be like a $20 drink or whatever, right? Um, and so he's like, I have to see the bill to see how much that cost. So we finally get the bill. And again, this is like a touristy area, a more expensive restaurant, right? And we get the bill and he looks at it and my drink is six and a half euros. <laughs> Like nothing. <laughs> Was this Friday? Yeah. 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 You were there. Yeah. Nothing, bro. We're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Things were so cheap. Yeah. Dark Cody's got a glass of wine for three euros and he said it was really good. Uh, just, just crazy. The kind of things. Also, what cracked me up is like, you could get like a bottled Coke and it would cost you like a couple of euros, like two euros or something like a bottled Coke, right? Like Mexican Coke or whatever. Or you could get a, beer and it would cost you like less <laughs> like beer was cheaper than soda um it was just it was just wild it was so nice to be in a place that wasn't california right where like everything's just so expensive here like i was just talking with my mom today um milk's over six dollars a bag of chips is like six and a half dollars like just unreal prices how much was the water actually they do charge you for water a lot in europe because people don't drink the tap water um you get bottled water uh nice bottled water it's in glass they use glass bottles for like everything which is awesome so yeah uh that was that was like barcelona i did no touristy stuff because i just couldn't um i just couldn't man i was just in like a downer mood um i was so tired so i basically like Showed up, played the tournaments, went back, slept. Showed up, played the tournaments, went back, slept. Just like over and over and over again. Couldn't really do any sleeping. Didn't get to see the city, which was sad. So like all in all, Barcelona was a bust. It wasn't, I'm going to be honest, it wasn't very fun. Um, by far, the most fun I had at the event, which I'm going to stress, if you've never been to like a pro tour type event, the most fun, I think, of the entire event is always, always, always the days leading up to the event testing with the boys where you're just like, you're just sitting there and you're just like, just you're all working together to like solve an issue for like eight hours. And then after that, you're so like, yeah, the bananas. Yeah. And drafting bananas. Um, you're sitting there and you're testing, you're testing, you're testing, you're testing, you're testing, just trying to like get more stuff done. And then, and then you need a break. So you're like, all right, no one talk about flesh and blood or I'll shoot you. We're going to go to dinner. So you go to dinner with the boys and nobody talks about flesh and blood for five minutes. And then someone asks, what about in this matchup, this, and then you just talk about that one thing for like two hours at dinner. And then you go back and you have to test it out. So you just start testing, 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 like, and then you go and you get drinks and they, I don't know. It's just like that environment is so fun for me. It's just so, it's such a good time. Um, you get to hang out with everybody. You make a lot of new friends. It's just fun. Uh, and we did a bunch of other stuff. Like, yeah, we bought a set of the new Magic set, like the new Ixalan set or whatever. And I haven't played Magic in like a long ass time. Some of us in the draft hadn't even played Magic. And so we just like all put $50 into the middle and we drafted this set. <laughs> and we played a tournament to see who took down the $50. Uh, I did not win. <laughs> uh, and I was reminded how much I did not like Magic the Gathering <laughs> when... I cast five total spells in a best of three and died. Um, but like just a really good time. Um, that part of the trip. So that was definitely, yeah, our lands, we didn't have lands. So we just had to like use flesh and blood cards and be like, all right, all my red flesh and blood cards are mountains and all my blue flesh and blood cards are forests. Uh, and then it's time to go home. So I, Get ready to go home. I have to wake up super early. It's like 6, 6 a.m. Uh, we drive to the airport. I get on my plane. And I realize that I have like... These are, these are basically like the only flights that I could get that would work out. So I didn't worry too much about the details. But I realized that I have a six and a half hour layover in Montreal. 
So I'm flying. It's eight plus hours from Barcelona to Montreal. I land. Six and a half hour layover. And then it's like seven hours from Montreal to San Francisco. And then I have to drive a couple hours from San Francisco to get home. And because I'm going the other direction, I'm gaining hours, right? I'm going against the time zone changes. Um, so I somehow managed to be traveling for 27 hours in one day, <laughs> which is awful. <laughs> and I do not recommend it. And worst of all is I can't, I can't sleep on planes. I can't sleep on planes. I can't sleep on trains. I can't sleep in cars. I can't sleep while traveling. Um, so I'm just sitting there like this on the train. I mean, on the plane. Avidus, hey, thank you for the, uh, hey, Vitalis, thank you for the five months, man. Um, I'm just sitting there on the plane like this for like seven hours. Just too tired to like actually do anything. But I can't fall asleep. So I'm just like super groggy, just miserable. Um, and that was my trip home. And then I finally get home. I wake up super early. And I log in to TFT and we start the box box challenge. <laughs> and that's that's basically where we are now. So did Flesh of Blood Worlds go good? No. <laughs> I sleep in Montreal during layover? No, but I tried really hard. Um, did Flesh of Blood Worlds go good? No. Uh, did I have fun? Yes. I still had some fun. It wasn't as nice as I wanted it to be. Uh, I wanted to be able to see some of Barcelona, go to a lot of the local food places and stuff. But the issue with the local food places was that I can't have cheese or dairy. Uh, and we had like two to three people with us that couldn't have different kinds of seafood. And Barcelona's like local cuisine has a lot of seafood um, or cheese. So we were just kind of screwed. So we had more Asian food than anything else, which was nice. I do like Asian food. My highlight, actually my highlight of the entire event was one, meeting a ton of people. But one person in specific came up and said, hey, it's really nice to meet you. Can you sign this for me? And I like sign a card for them, uh, which, by the way, my signature is so terrible. And I feel so bad anytime anybody asks me to sign cards. But then he goes, I had this custom made and I thought you really like it. And you may have seen it if you're on Twitter or whatever. Now, my Icelander is altered to look like Ari, Frost Queen Ari. And then they gave me this custom Ari playmat. So I got to play my Ari Icelander on my Ari playmat. And that was probably the highlight of the entire weekend for me. I thought that was the sickest thing. Um, I took a picture with him, posted it on Twitter. You can see it there on my Twitter account. Uh, yeah, I was so, so, so happy. That was It was incredibly nice of them. Absolutely made my weekend. And yeah. That was Barcelona story time. Not as exciting <laughs> as I wanted it to be. Uh, I was hoping to come back and be like, this is how I won worlds. Uh, but unfortunately, it was not to be. But yeah. Hopefully, we'll have another story time soon. Uh, I have Columbus, Ohio, a $20,000 invitational next week. Uh, so I'll keep you guys posted on that. And yeah, that's all I got.